Um, all right, so our first speaker is Stuart Ewan, who's a professor and chairman of the Department of Film and Media Studies at Hunter College. He's the author of PR, A Social History of Spin, All Consuming Images, The Politics of Style and Contemporary Culture, Captains of Consciousness, and Advertising in the Social Roots of Consumer Culture. And um, Ewan's presentation will be on pictures in our heads, public relations, and the cult of the image. And responding to his presentation uh, will be Paula Chakravarti, who's the newest member of the communication faculty at UCSD. Um, uh, Paula's done her doctoral studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she specializes in um, the study of telecommunications in India. Stuart? I only discovered the 35 minute rule last night, so uh, <laughs> this may be a talk that ends in the middle. Um, I would, but you know what, there's no wire, so I can't. Um, I have a tendency to walk when I talk, so. Uh, you know, it's funny because uh, uh, Carol in Introducing the conference, uh, talked about Herb's uh, guiding principles and principles for the communication department, and uh, talked about uh, not doing work that is trivial, uh, doing work that is important. Um, and there's no question. Well, I'm going to be moving back and forth. <laughs> um, uh, well, I think Herb is somebody who has long been aware that uh, intellectuals are capable of doing work that is truly uh, trivial. Uh, it should also be said, and this is something that has been an ongoing discussion between myself and Herb for more than 20 years, uh, that uh, was also aware uh, that intellectuals were capable of not of, of, of being sort of important in uh, political action and in creating a, 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 a good society for people, but he was also on the side of that aware of the potential dangerous roles that intellectuals play and have played over the years. Um, and was particularly aware of this in the context of communication studies, where at least two of 
intellectuals and of certain intellectual trends which I want to address today. Um, it begins actually about 100 years ago, and the year was 1895, uh, when a French sociologist who was anxious about the rise of working class militancy in Paris um, published a book which was called The Crowd. The book is still in print. The Crowd, the, the subtitle was A Study of the Popular Mind. This guy's name was Gustave Le Bon, and he was the most influential sociologist of his time. It's interesting if you go to a sociology department now, you think that Max Weber, you know, or Durkheim were sort of the leading lights of the field. But uh, in certain ways, uh, the memory of Le Bon has been excised from the history of sociology quite conveniently. This book came out in 1895, and within uh, two years it was published in 19 languages. Uh, and within two decades, the ideas that Le Bon laid out had influenced the thinking of a new battery of compliance <coughs> professionals, people whose job was uh, to analyze and understand and uh, give shape to what was then referred often to as the public mind. Le Bon's uh, thought is largely neglected today and as I said, very few sociology departments uh, introduced their students to the Kabbalistic tradition of sociology, which Le Bon was, in many ways, the founder of. Uh, but this book left an indelible imprint on the contours of our present day world, and it's one of the reasons why I want to open talking a little bit about it today. Le bon, as I said, was terrified by the rise of working class militancy, particularly after the Paris Commune, and was agitated by what he saw as a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a onslaught of unruly democratic attacks on traditional patterns of social distinction and deference that had for so many centuries really ruled European culture. And Le Bon, the social scientist, uh, craved order. A knowledge of the psychology of crowds, he warned, is the last resource of the statesman. And the crowd, this book which is certainly worth looking at again, is nothing less than his urgent attempt to scientifically analyze the workings of the masked mind the better to control it. Now, it should be said that Le Bon rejected the central idea that had dominated liberal political thinking since the 18th century, and that is the idea that people are intrinsically rational, capable not only of contemplating their world rationally, but also acting upon their world rationally. Although he, this, the kind of idea, for example, that gave rise to the Declaration of Independence, which is a basically a rational case uh, on behalf of overthrowing the king. While Le Bon uh, maintained that middle class individuals such as himself were still capable of reason and reflection, he saw the crowd as a lower life form. People who were driven by dark irrational forces by its spinal cord, he said. The mob is driven by impulsiveness, irritability, incapacity to reason, absence of judgment. Uh, he went on elsewhere in the book to say that in the crowd one finds characteristics that are most normally seen in women and children and savages. <laughs> Le Bon and those who followed his lead were the fathers of the modern science of social psychology a field that has only grown as the century has proceeded and is still exploding as we enter into a new millennium. According to their outlook, the capacity to analyze and appeal to the irrational is the key to leadership and social stability in the modern era. It wasn't just true of uh, 
Le Bon, Graham Wallace, a British political scientist who was the mentor for Walter Lippmann, who I would say is arguably, Kurt Schiller notwithstanding, the most influential intellectual, American intellectual of the 20th century. Lippmann's ideas really went very deep and far in this society. And uh, Lippmann, in a, a book called uh, 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 the, name of the, the reason in politics, I think, is what it's called. 1908 writes, the empirical art of politics consists largely in the creation of opinion by the deliberate exploitation of subconscious non-rational interests. Now, in the United States, where working class militancy and a contentious middle class reform movement troubled the sleep in the sleep of elites uh, in the first two decades of this century. Lebanian ideas found a very receptive audience. Robert Park, one of the founders of the Chicago School of Sociology, wrote his doctoral dissertation on Lebanon. Very favorable lead of Lebanon, I should say. Theodore Roosevelt kept copies of Lebanon's writings on his nightstand. Uh, um, Ivy Lee and Edward Bernays, who were in many ways the founders of American public relations industry, were both very deeply influenced by and uh, promiscuously quoted the works of Laban, often uh, plagiarized the words of Laban in their own writings and speeches. Um, from the First World War onward, uh, social psychology furnished the intellectual underpinnings for an emerging American persuasion industry. This is the moment when survey research became entrenched as a sort of a characteristic feature of American life, uh, when statistical and anecdotal studies of popular emotions in order to arrive at strategies for forging identifications between the crowd and its would-be leaders began to become the norm uh, uh, in this society. This is the roots of uh, focus group techniques uh, that are used today to predict the likely responses of customers uh, when they're shopping, citizens when they're voting, and jurors when they're deciding about justice. And at the end of the 19th century, Le Bon laid the way for these schemes. To know the uh, art of impressing the imagination of crowds is to know at the same time the art of governing them. Crowds have always undergone the influence of illusion. Whoever can supply them with illusions is easily their master. Now central within Le Bon's reverie on the mental life of crowds, and really where I want to go today, was an insight that is especially pertinent to the modern practices of persuasion. And that is the pivotal role of images within them. When studying the imagination of crowds, Le Bon wrote, we see that it, the imagination, is particularly open to the impressions that are produced by images. A crowd thinks an image, and the image itself immediately calls up a series of other images having no logical connection uh, with the first. And given this penchant for collective hallucination, Le Bon argued, those people who are interested in managing the emotions of crowds could not rely on rational argument. They needed, in certain ways, to become masters of using images as tools of communication. Ideas, he wrote, must assume a very absolute and simple shape. They must present themselves in the guise of images. Crowds, being only capable of thinking of images, are only impressed by images. For this reason, theatrical representations in which the image is shown in its most clearly visual shape always have an enormous influence on crowds. It is not the facts themselves that strike the popular imagination, but the ways in which they take place and are brought under notice. It is necessary that by their condensation, if I must thus express myself, they should produce a startling image which fills and besets the mind. Now, as social psychology matured, 
Lebron's ideas about the mental life of the mob, the crowd, the working class, uh, urban working classes, gave way to the common supposition that all people, high and low, in fact, were motivated by unconscious, instinctual baggage. In 1922, uh, Sigmund Freud wrote a book called uh, Mass psycho uh, called Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego. And in, which by the way, is a book that was a it opens up with this tribute to Levon. He says Levon basically understood the way in which the crowd mind works. The problem with Levon is that he only saw it as the way the crowd mind works. That in fact, what Levon was describing was the sort of fundament of the human psyche. Visual suggestibility, he wrote, uh, was an irreducible primitive phenomenon, a fundamental fact in the mental life of man overall. And with that, the basic form of public communication within Western democracies, to some extent, became a play of images, became, in certain ways, calculated appeals to the feelings of the population often very consciously bypassing critical thought. By the 20s in the United States, the dissection of the irrational was having a profound effect. The eloquence of images was being employed as a favorite instrument in all kinds of public address. The strategic wisdom of the day, where anybody who goes back and look at business journals and political journals of the time, is that to sell products to consumers, to link public loyalties to big business, to lead populations into war, the optical realm is a particular service. The primary translator of Gustav Lebon to the American audience was uh, the man whose name I mentioned before, Walter Lippmann. From 1922, the same year that Freud published his book on Lebon, uh, wrote a book which is still, I think, the most uh, naked explanation of public community strategies of public communication that I've ever read. Uh, a book which is called Public Opinion. A book which essentially assumed that people were incapable of understanding the world they lived in, that they were essentially motivated by pictures in their heads. This is how this opening chapter is defined. And that if a leader expects to be effective within the modern world, the ability to create those pictures was essential. The making of one general will out of a multitude of general wishes, Lupin wrote, is an art that is well known to leaders and politicians and steering committees. It consists essentially, this is maybe a little dense, but it's really good. I mean, it's really bad. <laughs> um, it consists essentially in the use of symbols which assemble emotions after they have been detached from ideas. Because... Say that again. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the use of symbols, he says, it consists essentially in the use of symbols which assemble emotions after they have been detached from their ideas. Because feelings are much less specific than ideas, and yet more poignant, the leader is able to make a homogeneous will out of a, heter out of a heterogeneous mass of desires. The process, therefore, by which general opinions are brought into cooperation, I love this language, consists of an intensification of feeling and a degradation of significance. I'm going to repeat that one. It consists of an intensification of feeling and a degradation of significance. Simply put, the seductive use of images would permit leaders to harness the irrational energies of the masses, provoking their passions, while at the same time marginalizing the meaning of what was actually being said. One of the things that's fascinating about this book, going back and looking at it, which is 1922, 
is the extent to which Lipman looked to Hollywood for guidance. The book is filled with discussions of how, how Hollywood films are capable of creating what he called handles of identification, which allow the audience to identify with what's going on in the story, which are able to link public fictions, as he put it, with a sense of private urgency. Hollywood was doing it most effectively, often on the silent screen, and it was something that leadership and politicians had to learn from. I mean, it blew me away when this summer, I feel like I'm chilling now. On August 18th, 1999, there's an article about how the Army has just organized a, 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 a it's called the um, Institute for Creative Technologies, which basically is hiring all these Hollywood people to create training films for the soldiers, because there's nothing sort of uh, political that the soldiers can particularly identify with. What they both need to do is create uh, new public fictions in order to stir up their sense of private urgency. That, now, this is nothing new. I mean, Hollywood and the war machine have been operating, exchanging saliva since the First World War. But, but, but uh, it is sort of interesting that, that the New York Times finally decided to cover it. Um, now, uh, there is a pivotal question that remains, and one that I want to address in my remaining 13 and a half minutes. Uh, and that is, what is it about images that made men like LeBron or Lippmann see them as such powerful tools for opening and housebreaking the public mind? Now, to some extent, um, it must be said that people like Lippmann and LeBon who grew up in a world, came to maturity in a world uh, where there were certain unavoidable first-hand observations regarding the power of the image. During both of their lifetimes, powerful new media technologies, new aesthetic outlooks were transforming the physics of perception, the relationship between the way people see and the way they understand the physical world. Materiality was giving way to uh, abstraction as a sort of basic way of experiencing current events, the daily news. Photography and motion pictures in particular uh, represented changes in the ways that both objective truth and subjective experience were being popularly understood and communicated. Now, for those of you familiar with this history, this is going to be a, a, a recitation. But when photography emerged in the 1830s and 40s, it represented a kind of sea change in the ability to replicate facts as they are observable to the human eye. Uh, since the period of enlightenment, artists have been trying to do detailed drawings which would have the kind of simulation of observable truth, but uh, would be able to trace the countenance of something they refer to as objective reality. But photography seemed to capture and preserve it as never before. I mean, this is still something that is noticeable in the language that we talk about taking pictures, not making them. Uh, we talk as if the, the photograph is, is merely lifting the skin off the visible world and uh, taking it as it is. Now this apparent duplication of visual truth, this ability to render a credible visual vernacular, it, it certainly explains one of photography's contributions to strategies of mass persuasion and in certain ways is a footnote to what Herbert was talking about when he was talking about the photograph on the space program on the cover of the New York Times. It should be added that by the 1880s in France and the United States, which seem to have been these countries that were in international dialogue over these issues, uh, uh, photography had become a uh, tool of police work in the court system. There were huge catalogs of criminal faces being 
sort of put together physiognomies and sort of uh, phrenological uh, synopticons of what is an intelligent face, what is a stupid face, what is a criminal face, what is a perverted face, what is an insane face. These, of course, became the raw material of Hollywood in the 1920s who turned criminal anthropology into popular culture with the whole development of typecasting as a basic way of reaching an audience instantly in a moment. That's a book I'm working on right now. I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but it's an interesting question. Um, so, in a, it was legal evidence. By the way, there was a great show that was, was originated at the San Francisco Museum uh, of Modern Art called Police Pictures, which was an overview of police uses of photography, which was just stunning. Um, well, I raised this just because the picture was something that was able to verify fact, and this was something that was increasingly taken for granted. If you had a picture of it, it was true. In a way that verbal rhetoric or written rhetoric didn't work so effectively at, in part, particularly among literate people who were able to understand sentence structure and argument and <clears throat> rhetoric. It should be said, uh, that it wasn't just the ability to create a kind of phantom objectivity that made the photograph so powerful. It was also something else, and something that would have been wrote about again in 1922 in uh, public opinion. Photographs, he said, have a kind of authority over the imagination today, which the printed word had yesterday, the spoken word before that. They seem utterly real. They come, we imagine, directly to us without human meddling. And they are the most effortless food for the mind conceivable. I had a way with words. Any description in words or even any inner picture requires an effort of memory before a picture exists in the mind. But on the movie screen, he says, the whole process of observing, describing, recording, and then imagining has been accomplished for you without more trouble than is needed to stay awake. The result which your imagination is always aiming at is real talk on the screen. In this concise discussion of the visual power of photography and, more importantly, of movies, Lippmann clearly understood the double-edged nature of these prototypically modern media. If if photographs or movies were capable of conveying a sense of objective reality, they would also engage people on more visceral levels of the imagination, uh, connecting to their dream life and to what was uh, fashionably called during those years the unconscious. Now unconsciousness has become so normal that we don't even think about it. Now the question is, How does this work? How does the photograph touch the visceral? And for me, the most, uh, one of the most uh, useful uh, experiences that I've had in terms of coming at this was uh, from a scene that you've all seen, I, I'm sure, in Orson Welles' famous Citizen Kane. You know the story, the, the search for it of the just what I need. <laughs> There's a scene in Citizen Kane where uh, the reporter is going around talking to everybody to find out what Rosebud meant. And he goes to visit Kane's former business manager, Bernstein, typecaster, <laughs> who's now an old man. And Bernstein ruminates for a moment when he asked about Rose, but on the texture of human memory itself. And he tells an incident from his youth. A fellow will remember a lot of things you wouldn't think he'd remember, he began. You take me. One day back in 1896, I was crossing over to Jersey on the ferry. And as we pulled out, there was another ferry pulling in. And on it, there was a girl waiting to get off. A white dress she had on, and she was carrying a white parasol. 
I only saw her for one second and she didn't see me at all. But I'll bet a month hasn't gone by since that I haven't thought of that girl. Now this um, somewhat haunting tale speaks to the sort of psychological dynamics of the mind, the power of the incidental and the momentary to inscribe itself upon a life. The way in which it can gain a kind of subjective significance that far outweighs the objective magnitude of the moment from which it's drawn. I think we probably all have some little fragments like this. And from early on, this was part of the uncanny capacity of photography. <coughs> that it was able to entrap the evanescent moment. It could defy the passage of time itself. I mean, we saw that few moments ago, and it can engrave itself upon the future. It was able to grab a transient gesture to enshrine sort of the commonplace and the incidental, and to hold on to things that previously survived only as faint glimmers of, re of recollection, and make them part of public culture. And they created in certain ways, and filled along with it, a kind of pipeline between a communication system and the inner lives of ordinary people that is one of the most sort of undeniable aspects of the world that we inhabit. Freud, of course, wrote extensively of the powers that such ephemeral impressions exerted in dreams and in the unconscious workings of the psyche. Incidental moments, he wrote, <clears throat> stood at the heart of character development and one of the basic assumptions of psychoanalysis was that within each of us, fragmentary mementos lie, concealed, asserting influence awaiting rediscovery. Photographs created a new visual paradigm that was in sync with this perspective. They could preserve the girl in the white dress. They could mimic the impassioned eyes of the young man on the ferry boat. They could stroke the depths of longing and cinema with its ability to emulate subliminal processes of mental association, montage, and cross-cutting only quickened the, the links between image and inner life. I was going to show you um, some pieces of a film that was made in 1924 by, by uh, Buster Keaton called, uh, um, by the way, the Wallace book is called Human Nature in Politics. A glimmer of, of memory. <laughs> uh, uh, Buster Keaton made this film in, in uh, 1924 called Sherlock Jr., which is in fact a story all about the way in which movies have become the fabric of the lives of ordinary people. And uh, it's a movie within a movie. He kind of starts out in the real world. He then enters into the movie. Even though the problems of his life are solved before he enters into the movie, it's not satisfying until he gets into the movie. And then he comes reunited with his girlfriend, and they sort of make uh, they, what, they, what they call, they pitch some woo in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, projectionist booth, taking instructions from the people who are pitching woo on the screen. It's a beautiful thing, and uh, you should check out this movie. It's actually on videotape. I, um, I raise this stuff in part to, uh, uh, to uh, open up some questions that I think we need to continue dealing with. And that is, we are aware of uh, the corporate structure of the media, and we are aware of the seductivity of the media. Um, but in fact, we, we actually understand very little about how it works. And there's very little about our education, which even attempts to instruct us on visual, on visual literacy. Um, we talk about how paragraphs have strategies, but when it comes to looking at, well, my, my art education was cutting out pumpkins on Halloween. <laughs> And uh, still, in one form or another, uh, in a world where visual rhetoric has become the primary form of public address, 
uh, there is absolutely no question that uh, for a uh, educational um, strategy to have anything to do with potentially empowering people and making democracy more than a sort of joke, um, it is essential for cri critical dialogue with the visual, not only just learning how to read lies, but also how to tell new stories visually uh, needs to become a part of uh, uh, how we educate our children and ourselves. This was a, had become a, uh, a, a basic lesson of the compliance industries in the 1920s. Uh, and it's something that's evident uh, already by 1925 when a guy named Harry Overstreet gave the first public lecture series on the subject of influencing human behavior at the, at the new school. And in it, he, su he summarized the process of visual communication with remarkable clarity and in certain ways underwrites the urgency of us, as we think about schooling, uh, to make uh, critical visual literacy a part of what we do. Images, he talked about something called selective pitch picturizing. And this was using images which emphasize selective ideas, which would lodge, he called, the power of suggestion within the dynamics of communications in order to induce an imagined experience. The secret of all true persuasion is to induce the person to persuade himself. The chief task of the persuader, therefore, is to induce the experience. The rest will take care of itself. The secret of it all is that a person is led to do what he overwhelmingly feels. And therefore, we need uh, uh, practice in getting people to feel themselves in situations is the surest road to persuasiveness. This kind of creating of situations for us and our comrades in this world um, is kind of the norm out there. Um, it's something which was highly informed by theory very early on in the 1920s. Uh, today, it is our job uh, to make sure that uh, we are all aware of the theory behind it, but also, uh, also able in our education and in our critical, uh, in our teaching, to ensure that students, citizens, consumers, people, uh, reach a point of becoming fluent with the visual not only so that they can cut through the ship, but also so that they can make new ship, which is what it's all about. <laughs>
actually what is sold in these, in, in, in these, in these parts of the world through advertising, through the PR machines, um, is the rehabilitation of the market and the rehabilitation of the identity of the entrepreneur and the consumer, displacing um, other types of identities, like of citizen and worker. And this is certainly true in India. I imagine it's true in other parts of the world where spin in its global dimension and PR in the age of satellite television um, creates these new types of discourses elevating um, market and the, the identities of the market and market society. In cultures in which there is already um, existing critical tools um, to think about the state and the heavy hand of the state, but Similar tools don't necessarily exist in terms of deconstructing the market and the power, the sort of soft power of the market through institutions, um, institutions and organizations of PR and advertising. And I think since Stuart ended his talk about it in terms of talking about visual literacy, um, I think in this global age of commercial media, um, it would be interesting to also think about the kind of necessary tools um, that that both as teachers, as thinkers, as, as activists, um, we can think about um, in, in confronting uh, the kinds of the kinds of uh, freedom that is associated with the cyber libertarian uh, discourses that permeate, you know, the IBM and the Microsoft ads that you see in this context, but which you also see in New Delhi, in Sao Paulo. Um, in contexts that are, are very different. And so I think it would be interesting to talk about, um, to maybe discuss both the historical and American uh, tradition of PR and in uh, 1895, in 1920, but also in 1999, and look at this phenomenon as a really global phenomenon. So um, with that, I oh, invite you to ask questions and um, comments. Have a microphone here, or you may be able to just uh, want to just stand up and ask questions. As a sociologist who's come out of the Chicago School, which was self-consciously a criticism of Lebon, it's a pleasure to hear Lebon and Lipman talked about. But I wonder if you would say a little bit, in in addition to your excellent paper on the limitations of visual imagery. After all, if we look at the political world, old demographic factors still play a huge role. Economics, ethnicity, to some extent gender, and that even in advertising there are limits beyond brand differentiation where advertising isn't that successful. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd say something about the limitations of visual imagery. The role of personal interaction, the role of positions and social structure. Yeah, well, that's. I think you you said it. There's more to the world than visual images, and so I'm under I'm, I'm, uh, I'm no circumstance. Oh, sorry. Right. Right.
is to see that dividing line broken down. And it's, I, I, while I acknowledge and, and, and uh, certainly my own work is often interested in ways in which people bypass these systems in their own lives, um, uh, I, I do think that part of what we're dealing with right now is a situation where, you know, if it's not a sales pitch, it's survival is in question. This is certain, you know, I teach at a very poor public university and on a, a, the City University of New York, much maligned. And it's a wonderful place and the students are amazing. And so, you know, think twice before you believe what you read in the New York Times or anywhere else about CUNY. But that's just, that's my own little sales pitch. But uh, what I was going to say is, in an environment like that, you really see the way in which commercialism sort of waves itself above your nose as the only route to survival. And where, you know, the schools are increasingly sort of inviting in a commercial presence, not because they embrace, you know, Ronald McDonald, you know, on some kind of spiritual level, but because it's a basic survival question. This is true of public schools. So, I mean, these are trends which go back to the 1920s. I mean, most of the, most of the, you know, the food chain, the food pyramid charts that we got, you know, were first they used to be done by the meat industry, now they're done by the grain industry. It depends on what is a good diet at any given moment. But, uh, no, the, we are in a situation where the, the borderline between what is an ad and what is reality has broken down, where students going out for job interviews are less concerned with their skills than their appearances. And therefore, this kind of world of packaging has become part of the inner fiber of existence. It's something that needs to be addressed. And as I said, the thing that bugs me the most about it is that we live in a society which is the most permeated by this kind of stuff of any society in the world, and which on an educational level is among the most primitive in its encouraging students to address it. So, you know, that's my little hobby horse. But of course, you know, we, we go out and smell the flowers. We should continue to do that. Um, you, oh. um, Stuart, you did a really wonderful job of um, reminding those of us who read Walter Lippmann how incredibly eloquent and powerful his writing was and how seductive his thought was. And, but as you were talking about him, I wondered what your thoughts would be about the Walter Lippmanns of our own age. Is there anybody, or um, is there anybody that you're looking at and thinking about who is as um, aggressively articulate as he was? Well, I think uh, I think around this kind of issue, no. You know, what should have been obvious from my talk. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a historian, okay. And so, um, in coming at uh, subjects which have, uh, are seen very contemporary and very new and very of today, my work has often been to try and go back and look at the roots of these uh, everyday institutions. And I think one of the things that I have found again and again and again is that in the first generation, uh, people are remarkably articulate about what they're doing because they're imagining something. I think what has happened is that the thought of Walter Lippmann has become essentially the finger knowledge of people working in uh, those industries. Um, and um, to some extent, the real thinking that's going on in those industries is trying to sort of target the more specific buttons and one of, you know, Lippmann's still writing at a time where he has this idea that you can create cooperation, you can create a homogeneous will out of a heterogeneous mass. Contemporary marketing techniques and merchandising techniques and political strategy techniques are much more attuned to social differentiation, to, to you know, sociological differentiation, and then built it into their strategy. So that I think those are the new contributions. But no, Lippmann, is a guy who liked Bernays, who liked Edward Filene, who a lot of the people who were, in many ways, the architects of the consumer culture, um, are people who are imagining a new way of life as it's happening. And so they're extremely articulate about what they're doing. If you go and talk to PR people today, when I was working on a book, I did a lot of interviewing. And it was interesting that there was sort of an in inverse proportion. And now I'm going to get myself into trouble. <laughs> There was an inverse proportion uh, between uh, the, the ability for people to understand the 
social significance of what they were doing and the recentness of their involvement in what, what they were doing. And, 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 and in, I'm talking about it in terms of the PR field. Um, and it's certainly true in the advertising field. Most of them view it as a job. Um, and uh, the kind of social realities which gave rise to that job are not well known. When I went to go see Edwin Bernays, which I'm embarrassed to say was one of the most amazing moments of my life, um, which I wrote about in the opening chapter of the book, um, this was a guy who was uh, remarkably aware of what he had done as a sort of work in, in history. And I would add, you know, was kind of weighing out in his mind the problem of having, for example, had such an unintended influence on Joseph Goebbels. Um, uh, 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 you know, I'm sure a lot of you, when you heard Le Bon immediately thought of fascism, because the, the links between Gustav Le Bon and German fascism, for example, are widely discussed. George Mossy, uh, a teacher of mine who just died this uh, past year, um, uh, spent a good part of his lifetime sort of laying out those sort of visceral links between Le Bon and fascism. And I remember having dinner with him in, a, in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. He lived very well. Um, um, uh, uh, when I was doing research on the book, and I said, you know, George, I, I, I'm, I, I'm rereading Gustav Le Bon, who I read as a freshman in your European cultural history class. He said, oh, really? And I said, you know, this everybody in the United States who was interested in sort of social stability in the early part of the century was completely flipped out of that Le Bon. He had never heard of it. He had never heard of it. Le Bon's I mean, I do believe that Le Bon's influence on American culture was something that, that would, has not been widely acknowledged, in part because of the close connection with fascism. Similarly, Bernays, I'm sorry, but it's a roundabout answer. Bernays was somebody who could sit back and say, well, you know, what I'm dealing with is fire, and it can be dangerous. And then he kind of shrugged his shoulders about, about parables and went on. Um, this was a man who was extremely aware of himself historically. You don't find that among most PR people in yeah. My name is Joan Segler. I'm a documentary filmmaker and producer, and I'm also a media activist. And I drove down here from Los Angeles because I was told about a conference called Media and Communication in the New Global Economy. Now, from my point of view, and the point of view of many of us, thousands of us around the country who were involved in a media and democracy congress, and media and democracy movement, I think it behooves us to start thinking about solutions to the problem. Because we, it is, to me, on a crisis level, where we have only five or six corporations controlling all forms of communication, controlling every single thought process we have is in the hands of just a handful of people. To me, this is fascism. And I think we need to do something about it. And that's why there is a media and democracy movement. Now that entails people going out with video cameras, digital video, high aids, and making films, making videos, and getting them up on public access or with the new um, uh, bandwidth that's going to be coming out, a way that we can start getting out our ideas on television. There is a micro power radio movement, which started out as a pirate radio movement, which has been struggling for years to be able to communicate either through 10 watt to 1,000 watt um, radio programs by people in communities around the country. And now the FCC is considering licensing low power radio. Um, there is a movement of people who are uh, printing newspapers. I mean, in San Diego, there's only one newspaper. In LA, there's only one newspaper. So I think we need to go out and make media. I think there's a point where we have to stop critiquing media, because that's all that's been going on. And we have to go out and make media and join a media and democracy movement. So. You're in Hunter College, you're the head of a film and video department. 
what are your students doing? They're making media. They're making media in terms of getting on public access, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in terms of joining Paper Tiger TV, et cetera. Some of them have actually joined Paper Tiger TV. Some of them actually, some of my faculty worked in Paper Tiger TV. Um, but no, I mean, you know, first of all, I think we have to stop critiquing and start making, you know, they go hand in hand. Thinking and doing are not sort of antagonistic to each other. Uh, but, but no, I mean, if you want the program at Hunter College, which is a really wonderful one, is a program which is more and more a program about doing alternative media. Um, we're using the, the bandwidth is not as broad as it needs to be. But, um, you know, we're, we're putting out stuff on the internet, our students are. It's not just the stuff about putting stuff on public access, it's also about reimagining the social relations in the media themselves. Because, you know, as long as people are sitting home on their couches, um, you know, it used to be citizen when it became consumer and it became couch potato. You know, whether it's Herb Schiller or whether it's Herb Schreiner, uh, they're still sitting on the couch. I mean, we need to start creating media which, which are engaged with, uh, uh, which, which encourage political discussion and public interaction. And I think one of the scariest things about the society that we're living in right now is the extent to which public life itself has disappeared. And so watching has become a surrogate for it. But, you know, I, I, I actually have been involved in the democracy stuff. It's, good. it's important to do. We have time for one last question. Uh, yeah, Dan? Yeah. Um, I guess this is a related question. It seems to me that um, Levon and Lipman and the other thinkers of that period that you were talking about pose a dichotomy between visual, emotional consciousness on the one hand and rational, critical thought on the other. Now, in, in the videos that we watched earlier on, one of the things that's really fun about making a Paper Tiger TV, I was involved in one with my colleague Virginia here once, uh, myself, is that you get to play with visual images in a way that you don't normally in academic writing. And you know, I think part of the idea is that it, in some way, um, you can communicate those ideas better. And I wonder if, if at the end of this work you have a critique of that social psychology or you have a different interpretation of the relationship. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not raising, I'm not, I, I don't think that the value of looking at LeBron is for us to become like antagonistic to images. Um, I just think it's interesting to see the kind of thinking that has motivated the generation of Im the generating of images to a large extent in our society. Uh, we need to imagine ways in which, uh, you know, I think that part of the reason why the image is always going for the gut is because the image is so often used in order to sell soap. Um, that if, in fact, people are developing, to use that term again, literacy in visual terms, my hunch is that they will be able to express ideas and critical thought as eloquently as they can on the written page. And simultaneously, we need to be aware of the way in which the written page and the spoken word are capable of get demagoguery as well. Uh, I don't think that I, I, I wouldn't say, you know, read, don't look. Um, I don't even read anymore. I mean, I just watch TV all day. Um, I, I made a movie this summer. I'm, I'm serious about that. I told myself how to do it, and I, that, I mean, it's, a, it's a comedy. It may not be what you're looking for, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I, I, I think that the issue is not that images are intrinsically appeals to the emotion and that words are intrinsically appeal to critical thought, but rather that the kind of thinking that, that, that guided the development of the image as the primary tool of public address in our commercial culture were attempts at bypassing thought on behalf of pushing emotional buttons. And that's really, I think, the point of Dr. Laban. You know, people have been making images from time immemorial. Um, it's, 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 it's what makes us human. Okay, and on that note, we're going to, um, I think that's all the time we have. Um, we're going to take a five-minute break before uh, Professor Asher. So, thanks so much.